Hello everybody, so we're coming towards our penultimate lesson here. We're going to be learning about fragrances and essential oils. You're going to need a calculator because we've got a couple of calculations in the Google form, your unit two notes to fill out as you go along with this lesson, and then also your unit four notes because in the Google form we have some questions to do with the research and chemistry aspect. Uh, pen and paper to do your calculations and also your rough workings. So here's your prior knowledge questions to get you started. Okay, so let's have a look at the answers. So we've got two chemicals here. We have uh, ammonia, here it is, and also we have trichloroamine. And they are different by the uh, atoms that are attached to the nitrogen here. Um, and that is gonna affect the polarity. So let's have a read of the information here. So ammonia is polar and trichloroamine is nonpolar. And that's due to the difference in the electronegativity between the atoms in the bonds. So the difference in the electronegativity here is quite great. The difference in the electronegativity here is not so great, and therefore this is considered to be a non-polar chemical. Next question. Okay, it's quite a tough one here. So what do we have here? Draw a structural formula for one of the amino acids that will be formed on the complete hydrolysis of the above cyclic dipeptide. So this is two amino acids that are joined together to form this cyclic, this sort of ring structure here is referred to as a cyclic uh, aspect of this chemical. Um, so what we're looking for here is hydrolysis. So we're gonna split the peptide group and that is gonna be split there. So right between that carbon and that nitrogen. And then on one side, from the uh, carbon side, we're gonna add an OH group. And then on the nitrogen side, we're gonna add an hydrogen and you will get these two chemicals here. So there's that OH group there that's been added. And there's that hydrogen group there that's been added. Okay, you could of course split it down here, that section there, and you would get the same idea. Okay, next question. Okay, so hopefully the first one was fairly straightforward. Draw the functional group for an aldehyde. That's what we've been learning recently. Um, it is a carbonyl group. And just have a read there of the additional information there. The functional group must show open bond. The aldehyde structure only acceptable if the functional group is highlighted, okay? So in other words, if you put the whole chemical here of an aldehyde, you would then have to highlight that carbonyl group there along with this hydrogen as well. Okay, next question. So which has been oxidized, which has been reduced? Well, it's quite, pretty tricky this. If you start with this here, it's quite difficult to actually see what's going on. I think it's easier if you start with what's happening with the copper. Well, the Cu2 plus is changing into Cu plus. In other words, it's gaining an electron. It's becoming less positive. Um, so that therefore, we can say that this here is being reduced. So that's not what we want. So we must be talking here about the reducing sugar here. So about the... Um, uh, C6H12O6. So I would then write out C6H12O6 here. I'd write over here what it's changed into, and then you would balance with the hydrogens, with the water molecules, with the electrons, and so on and so on. And you would eventually get this answer there. Apologies for it being a little bit small. Hopefully you can zoom in. Notice there in the hydrogen ion and the electrons that there are no um, charges on there. That isn't... Um, you wouldn't get marked down for that if you didn't include them, but it is good practice to include them, okay? Next question, state the color change that would be observed when reducing sugars are reacted with failings solution. It is this here, blue to orange, um, brick red is, is a term you may have come across before in S1 and S2 and S3, especially in biology. Uh, notice here that blue green is not acceptable as the original color. You have to say it is blue. It's that really nice blue color due to the Cu2 plus ions, okay? Moving on. So here's what we're going to be covering today. We're going to look at the uses, properties and synthesis of something called essential oils. Uh, you may have come across those before, so you may have so you more than likely have some in your house. Uh, we're going to look at what a terpene is. So now we're going to drill down into the chemistry of these things called essential oils. We are going to explain how terpenes are made from something called isoprene molecules. 
and then we're not going to be able to make an essential oil, but we'll certainly go through the theory of how to make an essential oil. The sort of questions you can expect are these. So just have a read of this, please, and then we'll go through the answer to this at the end. So we've got this term here, isoprene, that's going to crop up again and again as we go through it. So we really need to know what an isoprene unit is, that's going to help us out. So if you get uh, the vast majority of plants within those plants at some point, whether it's the bark or the leaf, um, they would have, or the flower, they would have what we call an essential oil in there, which let's just highlight a couple of points here. First off, these essential oils are volatile. Volatile means, if you can't remember, that it easily evaporates. They are non-polar oils. So in other words, they are not soluble in water. Because they're volatile, we can infer the sort of um, intermolecular forces they're going to have. If they e evaporate easily, the chances are they're not going to have too many hydrogen bonds. It's more going to be likely to be London dispersion forces. And the reason for that is, as we'll see their structure soon enough, is because they are hydrocarbons. So let's have a read of this. They can be extracted and concentrated to form a product called an essential oil. So let's just go over a little bit more about what essential oils are. Historically, they were used as medicines, although there's limited evidence that they have any medicinal properties nowadays. Most are hydrophobic, and that's due to their non-polar nature, so they don't like water. And the essential bit, we've come across the term essential before when we talk about essential amino acids. Well, that is not the same use of the, the word here. Essential means it captures the essence of the plant, if you will. Uh, and you may see these in your house. Some people put them on top of um, uh, on top of candles and, and there's a device where the essential oil goes on top of it. And then the heat then evaporates or heats up the essential oil. Those London dispersion forces break and the essential oil molecules will um, uh, evaporate off into the room and it makes the room smell quite nice. So you may have one of those in your house or you may be familiar with those things. We use them in the following fragrances cleaning products, cosmetics, and flavorings. So the actual chemistry of these things, well, they contain something called a terpene, and a terpene is a combination of small things called isoprenes, and an isoprene unit has the chemical formula, the molecular formula, C5H8, and it looks like this here. So this isoprene is, is one unit of an essential oil and it has that structure. And we need to know, we need to be able to identify that in chemicals. If you combine these isoprenes together, you will form a terpene and you can get different types of terpenes. We can get straight chain or we can get cyclic molecules. So for example here, this um, chemical here is called limonene. It's found in citrus fruits. It's got a really nice smell to it. Uh, notice that it's this hydrocarbon, therefore it's volatile due to the London dispersion forces. Uh, and here we have two different isoprene units joined together. And the reason why I can work that out very, very quickly is because all I'm doing is I'm counting the number of carbon atoms that I have. So if I know that a single isoprene unit has five carbons, if I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I must therefore have two isoprene units. So a little question here, this is the sort of thing that you could expect to see, which of those is an isoprene? And there is your formula, molecular formula for your isoprene units. Okay, so very quickly, hopefully you identified that it is B. Uh, it can't be A or D because they have oxygens, and in C there are not enough carbons. Another sort of question, can you count the number of isoprene units that you have in this terpene? So if you count all the carbons here, you'll come to the conclusion that there are 15, and therefore we must have three isoprene units that are joined together. So the way that these essential oils are made is by a process called steam distillation. And how steam distillation works is you have your water, and there's various different ways that you can do this, but this is a general setup here. You have your water, which is heated, and that turns into steam. The steam then travels up here, and as it gets to this uh, round bottom flask here, in here we have our plant material, whatever it is that we're trying to extract the essential oil from. 
That will then evaporate. It will go down our condenser. It will cool down. And then your um, distillate here will be collected in this beaker. Now, that's going to be a combination of water and the essential oil. So you can then evaporate the water off again, or you could just keep it as it is. So the essential oil collects as a mixture of oil and water, but as the two do not mix, they are easily separated. And in the next video, or the video I'm, uh, I'd ask you to go and watch, um, you have the um, method, a more detailed method for how to extract these essential oils. So I would ask that you pause this and then go and watch this video. The channel is called Nile Red. I've recommended this before. It's absolutely brilliant. And the uh, gentleman has a video on how to extract cinnamaldehyde from cinnamon using steam distillation. It's only a few minutes long. And he refers to a chemical called DCM quite regularly. That's dichloromethane. So it's really the first two to three minutes that we're interested in. The latter half of it is uh, just for your interest. So that's us pretty much finished. So let's go through some past paper questions here. So this is the one we saw at the beginning. Uh, pause this and then have a go at this question. So state the name that is given to molecules consisting of joined isoprene units. So when you join these C5H8 molecules together, you will get a terpene. Okay, so there's a lot going on here. So if you wanna pause this and have a good read, um, and then you can maybe draw something in your notes and uh, we'll go through the answer in a second or two. So what you're looking for here is something like the following that I showed before. The idea is, is that you have water or steam rather that has been evaporated and it is then passing over or through some plant material to extract that essential oil from the plant. Then a condenser and then something to collect the material at the end. So here would it be our plant material, our condenser to cool that back down into a liquid and then something to collect our um, distillate there. So the next question is the essential oil extracted is a mixture. Suggest a technique that could be used to separate the mixture into pure compounds. Let's have a look at the answers for this one. So you might want to pause this and uh, read through the um, uh, answers for this one. I think that'd be very useful. Okay, so a bit of problem solving here. So have a go at this one. Okay, so this is really quite complicated, this, but we can use this information here to help us out. So first off, we have something, we haven't come across a diene before, uh, but that is a molecule which has two of these carbon to carbon double bonds. So let's try and work out this here. So first off, we have our functional group here, our OH hydroxyl group here. That's more towards this side. Therefore, this is our first carbon. So remember, I start uh, naming these from the right-hand side. So this would therefore be one, two, three. So it would be three ol. Um, if you look here, the positioning of the carbon to carbon double bond comes next in this chemical's name. So two, six refers to this carbon, that part, and then this part here. So that's two, six diene. So we'll do the same for ours now. So where's ours? Well, ours is on the first one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So it is therefore going to be one, six diene. Next, we have the um, longest carbon chain has been numbered, has been named rather. We're the same here. We're also octa because we have eight carbons in this chain. And then we have two methyl groups on the third and the seventh. Well, where are they, are they on ours? They are on the third. And the let's just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're three, seven as well. To we give you three, seven dimethyl octa one, six diene three of. Okay, so that's just done. If you can have a go at the Google form, and it's a bit tricky than normal because I have thrown in some um, research and chemistry, some unit four questions, just because there aren't that many questions based on this topic. So you may want to use your notes in this. Come to the Google Meets, email me, ask for help if necessary. Um, and thank you for watching. Bye for now.